Okay, so in this video, we're going to be talking about the last theorem in this series on vector calculus, and it is called Stokes' theorem. So I mentioned this theorem before when we were talking about Green's theorem, and the reason I did that is because Green's theorem is actually a special case of Stokes' theorem. So just to refresh your memory a little bit, Green's theorem is essentially telling us that if you have a curve that only exists on the xy plane, and it is a closed curve C, such that the normal vector to the area enclosed by that is always pointing upwards along the z direction, so it is defined by this, then if we were to take the co of a vector field with respect to that um, normal vector, then we would actually get uh, the following expression. And it turns out that this expression here gives us the total uh, line integral of the vector field along that curve C. Now, what happens if instead of confining the curve to the xy plane, you actually take a general curve in three dimensions, which is which marks the intersection between two different surfaces. So for example, let's call this plane S1, and let's call this little cylinder here S2. Now what's going to happen is that those surfaces are going to intersect at a specific plane and then in this case they're intersecting at a particular curve because we know when two planes intersect they intersect at a curve or a straight line. So essentially now we have the exact same case that we had before but we have a more general case and then if we were to compute the line integral of that curve with respect to some vector field in three dimensions, then what we would end up having is this would be equal to the total surface integral of the circulation or essentially just the co of the vector field F. So if we think about Green's theorem and we think about bringing it to the third dimension, then what we're essentially doing is we're obtaining Stokes' theorem. Conversely, if we were to just take the more general case, which is Stokes' theorem in three dimensions, and we bring it down to two dimensions like this, then we would get a Green's theorem. So there's a really important connection between those two theorems that we need to point out. Now, the idea behind this is that if you were asked to find the line integral on this, you could easily do it like that, if you could actually define the curve as the intersection of two surfaces, or you could do the opposite. If you wanted to find the circulation of the field, so that would be this integral, then you would simply uh, take the line integral of the vector field along the curve C. So let's do an example now. Suppose we have uh, an intersection of two surfaces. So we have a cylinder of radius 1, so this one is the, the green cylinder here, and it is intersecting a sphere of radius 2, just that we have here, so sphere of radius 2, we have 4, so that's 2 squared, so the radius is 2. And they're intersecting at some point, so it creates kind of like a little dome here at the top. So that's the surface S. Now, if we actually take the curve at which the two intersect, so the curve that marks that entire um, outline, the boundary of that, of that connection, then what we actually end up getting is we're actually going to cast this particular integral into a line integral along that curve C. So they ask us to find the circulation integral of that vector field F on that surface. So we're going to use Stokes theorem to evaluate that. So we're going to set up the integral. This is going to be equal to F. So now in order to evaluate this, because this would be a little bit complicated to do, we would need to calculate the curl first, then take the dot product with the surface, so that can, be, that can get a little bit complicated. So let's simplify things by doing this. Alright, the first thing we need to do is to find out um, a correct, a proper parameterization for the curve C. So if we look at this from the Z axis, so basically from the top, and we draw this intersection on the XY plane, we notice that this is going to, since uh, the green cylinder is a cylinder of radius 1, then this curve is just going to be a circle of radius 1. So we have 1, 1, minus 1, and minus 1. So we have this curve here. And now what we're going to do with that is we're just going to try to find a parameterization for that. So in this case, C is going to be represented by a curve of some parameter t 
in let's use polar coordinates for that or in this case cylindrical coordinates so if we were to find x y and z in terms of that parameter t then we know in cylindrical coordinates what we have is the following we have x is equal to r cosine of t in this case r is a constant radius of 1 so that's going to be 1 times cosine of t then y is going to be sine of t and now what is z going to be? we don't know what z is because according to cylindrical coordinates we have r cosine theta, sine, r sine theta and z is just equal to itself so in this case z is just going to be the particular plane across uh, which this curve exists so this curve exists only on a plane like this so what we need to do is we need to find exactly at which point on z those two, the, the hemisphere here or the essentially that sphere and the cylinder intersect so how do we do that? well we need to grab these two equations and we need to essentially solve for z so one thing we can do is we can subtract this from the top just to get rid of x and y so basically x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals to 4 minus x squared plus y squared equals to 1 so we subtract the two equations so those terms cancel out we're left with z squared equals to 3 which means that z is going to be equal to plus or minus square root 3 now we know that this intersection happens along the positive z axis so obviously the the term the numeric numerical value that we're going to choose is just the positive square root 3 so basically this curve exists at the point or at the plane z equals to positive square root 3 so that is the plane or the function of z that we're going to put into our parametric equation here so this is going to be cosine of t sine of t and then square root of 3 okay so now that we have that we can actually proceed and take the derivative of that so we know that this is going to be so let's take dr dt so what is this going to be? well this is going to be minus, cos minus sine this is going to be cosine of t and then the last one is just 0 and then if we multiply everything by dt then we have dr so we have f dr we take the dot product of those two functions now obviously we need to convert this to, po to cylindrical coordinates as well so let's just do that so the first component of this is going to be xy so that means this is going to be cosine t times sine t the second component is going to be y actually that's x set so my apologies for that x set that's going to be square root 3 times cosine of t the second one is going to be y set so that's going to be square root 3 times sine t and then the last one which is xy that one is going to be cosine t times sine t and then this is going to be taking the dot product with respect to this quantity here so that's going to be minus sine t cosine of t and then zero and remember we need to include the dt here because that's the variable we're integrating with respect to so now let's carry out this multiplication here so we have square root of 3 cosine t sine t and this one is going to be negative now the second one is going to be this times that so plus square root of 3 cosine t sine t should probably make this sign so we notice immediately that these two are going to cancel out and then the last one is going to be this times zero so zero and all of this times dt and it turns out that everything here is zero huh that's an interesting result because that means that if we integrate if we take the line integral of this with respect to the curve r then this is the same as saying well this is just the integral of 0 dt which is just 0 
So it turns out that this integral, this circulation of the vector field, integral with respect to the surface S, is just going to be zero. And we could essentially evaluate this using this integral, and we should see that we would obtain exactly the same answer. But this is just um, to show you that there are some very useful integral theorems in vector calculus that can be used to simplify problems quite a lot. And sometimes they actually give us some really, really nice results. In this case, we didn't have to do much. We only took the dot product of this vector field with this. And then after that, it was pretty straightforward. We arrived at a, at a pretty easy answer after that. So hopefully, this has shown you that vector calculus does not need to be as hard as it seems, as long as you understand the main theorems and as long as you understand what is the actual uh, geometry or the physical interpretation behind all of those quantities.